Okay, thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. My talk is about uh, the tools that ESO provides for you to do your own data reduction. Data reduction. Data reduction, that is the process of turning the raw data as they come out of the telescope into some useful science products. So the first good news about it, ESA is actually doing it for you. Because I mean, as you, as you have heard about the talks from my Martino and Alberto about the archive, we are actually producing useful science products from the raw data for you and put them in the archive. So you can just download the finished products uh, from the archive. So why would you worry about it yourself? Well, for one thing, we don't provide it for all the instruments, all modes yet. So for some data, you actually have to do your own data reduction. There's also the case that uh, you want to do the data reduction a little bit different because we don't know how you're going to use the data. So sometimes for a different science goal, you want to reprocess the data different from what we did. And so we give you the tools to do that. There's also the use case of post-processing uh, some of the products we provide to you. That means you download data from the outside and then do some additional processing, which we again, we couldn't do, we cannot easily do because we don't know enough what you actually want to achieve. But then the one thing I want to really highlight here is doing your own data reduction gives you an understanding of your data, which you don't have when you just uh, use the finished products that somebody else reduced to you. And I want to uh, show you some examples. And doing that, I will do what other speakers did yesterday already, show you some important science results. The difference is, it, the science results I'm going to show to you, you probably have never heard about. There was no press release about them, and for good reason. So my first example is here the discovery of a Redshift 8.8 galaxy, which was discovered uh, with Vulcan. So how that works, on the right hand side, you have a broadband image, a J-band image, and on the left hand side, you have a narrowband image, of the same field and the narrow band filter is tuned towards a, red, a very high redshift. And you can see in the broadband, in the broadband uh, image, you can, it's deeper because you can just collect more light. So there are objects which you barely see or don't see at all in the narrow band image. But there's one prominent object which is inserted in green here which is not visible really in the broadband, but it's prominent in the narrow band. So this is a typical sign of a bright emission line, and since the filter was tuned towards this high redshift, and it clearly seems to be an extended object, I mean, it, uh, it was interpreted as a redshift 8.8 galaxy. And it's quite an interesting object because it looks uh, uh, very big. It looks like an evolved galaxy, which you don't really expect at that kind of redshift. So it's an exciting discovery, besides the fact that it's actually an artifact. So and you know that it's an artifact when you look at the individual images. So the images I showed you in the previous slide, there was a combination of many different images. So if you look at the individual images, here that's a, that's a narrow band. So the first thing you notice of this object, of this supposedly uh, narrow line object, that it changes a little bit position from, from image to image. And I mean, here just to guide your eye, and here you can see here it's a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left. So relative to, to the other bright object in, in the field, it changes the position, which of course uh, you don't really expect. Now, when, when you look at it uh, even closer, you, uh, you see that it also uh, changes the brightness of, uh, uh, between the image, relative brightness relative to other objects. Now, when you look at those images and you look at the images we were taking before that, you will see uh, uh, that this is this image which was taken of a different field which was taken with the same detector. And you can see at the position of the putative uh, galaxy, you see a bright star. 
in the, which changes the position at the same time. So the galaxy you saw before is actually only the effect of persistence, which means a bright object which is, uh, is imaged in, in, uh, in one frame is also visible in the next frame. So one has to be skeptical when one uh, uh, observes something like that. And this is a, a known uh, weakness of the work on uh, a detector that it shows a lot of persistence. Let me uh, give you another example, and this is of an uh, exciting result you probably never heard of. And this is about the uh, uh, LMC variable which changed spectra during an uh, eruption. So on the left hand side, you can see the magnitude of the star as a star as a function of time. You can see the year, and you see here it suddenly becomes brighter. And right at the time it becomes brighter, the spectrum changes radically. And you can now see a particular interesting is here the helium 2 line, where it is actually appeared before the eruption started, slightly before it started, and then it disappeared. And here you have uh, zoomed in on, on the helium line. Again, an exciting result with needs no explanation, besides that it's actually an artifact. And as you can see here on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you see the same spectra and uh, uh, the same, very same raw data reduced in a different manner. It was just one uh, simple parameter in one of the recipe for some of the calibration files that was changed in those uh, prominent. Uh, feature of the, of, of, the, of the line just uh, disappeared. And this was actually just an artifact. Finally, I uh, have an, my uh, last examples here, the twisted isoport in NGC 4473. What you can see here is a news image, a white light news image, so where all the spectral channels are combined. And they uh, are superimposed on the image are the isoports from, from that image. Uh, and for what you can see when you look closely at, uh, at it, you can look at the position angle of the isoport. For example, here, it's for the, uh, for the second inner uh, isoport, it's at the position angle. But when you go further out, the position angle seems to change. Set up is a function of a major axis, the position angle, and you can do some modeling. And this is, is a well-known uh, uh, feature, there's, there's, there's uh, some good theories how, uh, to explain how the twisted isoport uh, can occur. And again, it looks as a completely plausible uh, result, which one is ten, uh, tends to believe, but when you look closer, it actually is just an artifact. So this is the same, very same data, and this example was actually provided by Lodo Boccato. Um, the very same data, uh, reduced in a different way. In that case, it was the, the alignment of the individual images which went into the final image was improved. So there's a possibility that we provide with our tools. And what you can see, the isoport look much more uh, well aligned. So when you now take the uh, uh, measure the uh, position angle of the inner isoport and, and the outer, and it all seemed to be aligned. And the plot looks, looks like this, and here the grayish line is what we had before. So all of this, I'm, I'm, I'm showing all <coughs> this to you to uh, make you aware of possible pitfalls and also to really advocate, one has to be skeptical about any results and about any data reduction that was, was, has done, any reduced data. I mean, the, we, we getting raw data from the telescope, which presents the truth in some distorted way, and we do a lot of reduction to extract the real science results from it, but there's a lot of uh, assumptions, there's a lot of procedures, a lot of things can go wrong. So completely plausible uh, results might actually not be, uh, 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 be what it appears to be. So and for doing that, what we uh, what ESO provides are the uh, pipelines, pipelines that are basically our data reduction system. 
Uh, this, uh, this consists of the pipelines. The pipelines are part of the uh, induction system. These are basically individual standalone programs which one can write. Right? In, in the most general sense, they take as an input some of its files, the raw data or, or some of the data which has been processed before, and create something out of them, new FITS uh, files, and, uh, and you have, can tune them with some parameters. Now, you can, of course, in principle, run those. So, uh, those programs one by one with recipes, but there's a lot more thing you have to do to do the data reduction. I mean, the first thing you have to organize the data. You have to make sure that the right data go to the, uh, to the right recipe. You have to organize then the output again uh, and move, uh, move it on, pass it on to the next recipe. You have to uh, think about the recipe parameters, uh, play around possibly with it and fetch and them. And then, of course, you have to really inspect the results, including the intermediate results, plot them and look at them in a critical way, and uh, possibly how to improve them. And all this is, of course, connected to each other. You plot uh, results and then uh, set the parameters in a different way based on what you found in, in the plots, and so on. And the system we provide for doing all this is called ESO-Reflex. So this is the isoreflex data reduction environment. And what you can see here already in the background, that is a presentation of the reflex environment. So this is not just uh, a plot that shows you in principle how a pipeline works, but this is actually a program which you can use to interact. And the talks that follow me will demonstrate that in much more detail. So what I will do in the remaining time I have left here, just to give you a very basic overview uh, of the reflex environment. So what you, so this is uh, the, the workflow for Hawkeye, which is uh, uh, the infrared imager. And you can see all, every screen box here is basically a program. The screen boxes which, which, which you see here highlighted, these are the recipes, these are the programs that uh, take the fixed files and produce some new fixed files. So we, you have to, uh, to run them in order and the, the arrows indicate where the output of one, one of those recipes goes, how it goes to the next one. But again, in order to run them, there are more things. You can see there are other things on, on, on this were close that are not uh, that are not recipes, and I want to briefly explain what it is. But I want to use a more uh, simple case in the Hawkeye pipeline. So let's look at uh, something a little bit more simple, which is the fourth imaging workflow. So the first imaging pipeline basically has only three recipes. And there are <coughs> The uh, box in here, so it has a recipe to combine the raw master frames so to make a master bias out of many uh, individual raw master frames. The same things for the uh, flat, and then it has a science recipe that actually then produces the final science images. So these are the main component of the pipeline. But let's look a little bit on. on uh, with some of the other things on, on this workflow. I mean, I, I skipped the first one because it's just an initialization of all of that. But the first interesting thing which is done is the data organizer. So the data organizer is the part which looks at all the data which you have on, on your disk and organizes it. That means the first thing this program does, it looks what kind of files do you have. There are many different files, so this is, the, uh, this is your uh, a data set you might have, and it consists of a science image and a bias and a flat. But the FITS file itself uh, is it's just a file, so based on header keywords, you can categorize uh, those different uh, files and it gives them a category. So that's an important piece of information, of course, you need to have before you feed the recipe in any uh, useful way. The other thing you need to know is how to actually use them. Because you can see, I inserted here the dark, but there are the dark frames in the same data set. So for the reduction of the reduction of the same science image, that is the, the final step here, you use different darks, but you use them in different ways. So there are also rules how to do that, and then you uh, can follow that and, and record that. So the purpose of each of those raw files 
is also recorded and organized. And this might seem like an easy task or something like a, 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 a fourth instrument because there are very few file categories. But if you think about an uh, instrument like Xshooter, where you have literally dozens of different uh, file types which interconnect, which are very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to recognize, to know what's, where they belong to, what to do with them, this is already a major task, which will, will man, if you were to manually do it, would take you a long, long, long time. And it's almost impossible to do sometimes manually. So this is a, uh, the first component, the, uh, the data organizer which we do at the beginning of, of, uh, of, of running the pipeline. Then the next step is to select which of the data which do we actually want to, uh, to process and reduce. And, the next, uh, and then you go, the pipeline, the, the system goes ahead and takes all this information which was produced during data organization and uses them to distribute the files. So this is what's called the FITS router, and you can see it's connected to the different kind, uh, to the different recipes here. So the FITS router takes as input all the files which belong to one data set and distributes them. So the biases go to the master bias recipe, the raw images go to the science recipe, and so on. So the connections on the workflow, which you can see, they uh, they uh, uh, channel those different files to the recipes, and the, the, the way how they are distributed, this is this fits order. And then the next step is once a file files all the bias files so, uh, 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 arrive here at the master bias recipe, uh, they will be produced. And again, this is just a, a standalone program which actually in, contains the algorithms. It's of course the recipes are the brain of the whole thing. They actually uh, do uh, they actually do the work in, in, in processing the data and so on. So the, in, 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 in speak of reflex, all those green boxes are actors. And I've explained to you that different kind of actors are actors that are just doing the, uh, contain the recipes, that do the recipe uh, 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 processing, and there are actors that, that are important for the data organization for, for, for distributing the data and doing all other bookkeeping stuff. One important thing is to point out what I kind of mentioned already before. I mean, you can see, for example, the master bias, the output of this uh, uh, program goes to two different following recipe. One is a flat recipe here, and the other one is a science recipe. But this does not mean that it, uh, you use exactly the same master bias for both of those uh, recipes because a uh, flat might have been taken at a different night or in, in, at a different time. So different kind of biases are used. So this internal bookkeeping, what I called before the purpose of a file, this is all taken into account here. So the, the fact that there's a one line coming out here does not mean that it's uh, only one file. It contains all the files which are needed and then they are distributed to the different recipes as the original data organization uh, called for. So then, the, let's go back to, uh, to the workflow. So we have seen uh, the recipes. There's one recipe, the second one, the, uh, the third recipe. Finally, the next step here is the product renamer. This is um, where you give the final name according to your own criteria, which you can figure uh, what, how to organize the output files. And finally, you get to the product explorer, which is a means to actually look at your results. So this is. When you explore results, this is how this tool looks like, a product explorer. So once it automatically pops up when, when you're done with a, a reducing uh, a data set. And on the left hand side, you can here see this data set was actually reduced several times. So it keeps a record of everything you do. You see sometimes it was successful, sometimes it failed, maybe because some of the parameters was, uh, were set differently. You can then look actually at the results and look at all the files which went to produce a particular file, uh, uh, final product here and look at them individual. You can look at the, at the header keyword. You can also plot them, look at, uh, at, at images of the file and investigate it. 
And in the course of this kind of investigation, you might find things as, uh, as I shown before, like the like the provenance or that some uh, something looks strange about a spectral line, and you can uh, see this, and you can change this uh, by rerunning the workflow. So this is uh, again uh, the more complicated uh, example, the full-fledged Hawkeye workflow, which in principle looks the same way, but it has just more recipes here, and they are uh, highlighted here with orange boxes. That means that in uh, in this those steps you actually can do some interactivity. You get some plots. You can investigate it. So there are special tools which will be part of the demonstration, uh, which come later. And I don't want to go into it any further, but I want to uh, bring up one final thing. This is the iteratively improving results. Because my whole point before was, you have to look at the results. Uh, you have to look at the intermediate results, and then you have to experiment. As you can have seen in my uh, plot of the Provident Explorer, this particular data set, I already produced several times. Sometimes it failed, sometimes it didn't. So you want to typically want to rerun it many times in uh, your uh, workflow and, in, and change something along it. But when you change something, say in the bias recipe, that doesn't really mean you have to, uh, to rerun all the other recipes. But some you do. If this bias was used for the flat, you need to rerun the flat recipe. So what uh, Reflex has is a lazy mode. When you rerun, the, uh, the workflow. So you do the same data set over again. It has internally as a bookkeeping in the record, and it knows what it has to do. So typically, when you rerun the workflow on the same data set, it goes much faster than before. In the extreme case, if you didn't change anything, it basically doesn't need any uh, uh, CPU for the recipe. So for the recipe, so just with the overhead of actually organizing the data, running them, and, uh, and, 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 and but the basic, uh, it, it, it's very fast uh, because no work actually needs to be done. However, if you if you're doing a more complicated workflow, you have changed one parameter, either a parameter or, or, or the input file, so anything on the, on the workflow. Then the system figures out itself which of the recipes need to be rerun and which are, do not need to be rerun. So this is a very convenient, very efficient way of running the data organization without doing all this bookkeeping uh, by hand, the manual bookkeeping, which typically leads to redoing things because you just don't remember whether this is now uh, needs to be redone or not. So this is an important part of the system that it gives you all the means to redo things, both in terms of actually providing the information, gives you the plots, gives you uh, the way to explore, to drill down a data set, but then also efficiently to uh, rerun it. And this is an important feature for things when it takes, uh, that take very long to run. So finally, and then I want to um, finish up here, a summary of what I uh, basically told you. I mean, this recipe that I, I used by the pipeline, these are the same recipes we also use to produce the archive uh, data. Archive data. And also the same recipes I used in Paranal on, on, on the, at the telescope to do the initial uh, quality check on the data. So you, and really all over we use these recipes and the, and the recipes themselves, so there's no, no improvement in, in the algorithm when you redo it, but it's the way you uh, redo is your, your reduction in terms of parameters, in terms of what, what the input files uh, uh, you put in, maybe removing some of them, experiment how to combine it with different uh, kind of data set. That's, a, that's a, the kind of thing you have control over, but not over the actually algorithm in terms of what we provide you. When you use the recipes, and I will come to uh, lay back what, 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 what you can do when you want to introduce your own algorithms. Then the 
as the workflow which you have seen, which you see initially, it really documents the dependency. So you understand actually what happens. You understand how those different recipes are connected to each other. And you can see actually in real uh, time how the data move from one recipe to the next. And again, this will be part of the demonstration uh, uh, that follows uh, this. Then the organization of the data is a very, very, very big deal. It sounds like a small thing, but it's a very big deal. So it's a nicely well organized data in an optimum way using the optimum uh, uh, say biases or the optimum plots uh, with, with different kind of strategies you can do. So this is all uh, coded and uh, with, uh, with rules, which in principle can be changed, but they typically don't need to uh, be changed. But this is completely automatic. You don't need to worry, am I really feeding the recipe with the, with the right data? Because if there is something missing, if the data are not there, if you don't have the data to do it, uh, Reflex will tell you. They'll tell you this is incomplete and you can remedy the situation. And basically, you start Reflex by uh, uh, doing the click on the run button, and then you see how 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 the reduction of the pipeline progresses. Uh, you can see which of the uh, recipes are uh, executed at any one point, so you can monitor the progress. The bookkeeping is fully automatic, so later on you can actually look at what what happened. You can. Uh, can revisit some of the intermediate and look at the intermediate data products and, and, and it's presented to you to easily find them. We have ways to uh, plot the results. It's, uh, this is included in many of the workflows. So that means these are uh, plots which are very specific to a data uh, product, so it's not just a generic uh, tool to look at images, but we will be plotting exactly the critical things, which we know already might uh, be of a problem, that we know that other things one, one usually should, uh, uh, should investigate and, and keep a critical eye on. We allow those predefined interactions, like the, the change of parameters, and Finally, uh, there is actually the possibility also to insert uh, your own routines in the middle of the workflows, and that will also be part of the demonstration, which comes later. And that's, I want to stop here then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Oh, there's somehow a Okay. okay. Maybe can you okay. for the moment switch off your microphone? Okay, thank you. Um, so we have one question from uh, Thibault Mer. Um, I will read it to you. So can we retrieve data directly from Reflex or do we have first to request the archive for the science and calibration FITS files? You first have to get the data. I mean, Reflex uh, looks at a, a data directory which you have on your disk. So there is no retrieval of data, no automatic retrieval of data. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Wolfram? So since I know it sometimes takes a while before people before it pops up, so to say, on my end, um, I will ask a question then maybe in between. So you showed us that uh, the router of uh, of, reflex, of the reflex workflow is the one um, that um, does the organization of the data, right? And can we use that feature um, to produce the SOF files for ESO reflex input? Okay, first of all, the router does not actually organize the data. It's a step before, so the router uses this information of the organization of the data. Um, yes, you can actually, I mean, the, the router produces, the SOFs are uh, produced 
of course, only for the first recipes, and then the, the SOF for the next recipe is produced after uh, one recipe was run. But all the, these SOFs are actually available, and yes, you can use them, and yes, yes, you can manually run ESOREX with, with those SOFs, and it works fine. Okay, great. Thanks.